The year is 2257, in the wake of an interplanetary war that almost destroyed the human race. There remains one last hope for peace in the galaxy. Babylon 5, an orbiting diplomatic outpost. Its mission, to maintain order. Will you stand together? The reality, an ongoing struggle between hostile races, what? where war and peace hang in the balance. This is the story of a television sensation, a science fiction saga of Homeric proportions, and all from the imagination of one man whose epic vision springs to life here on the set of Babylon 5. Just yell lunch. This place is as big quiet as a church. <laughs> Where'd they all go? Hi, I'm Bruce Boxleitner. Welcome to the 23rd century. This is where I work every day as the leader of Babylon 5, a free port for diplomats, travelers, and businessmen. A combination of, well, the United Nations and Times Square on an intergalactic scale. In the next half hour, you'll meet the humans and aliens who live here and the actors and filmmakers who bring them to life. You'll also get a sense of what makes this more than just another TV show and why our fans get so involved, and why we're so excited about doing this Emmy Award-winning show. So, set your watches ahead about, well, two and a half centuries, and stay with us as we explore Babylon 5. Babylon 5 is a space station on a peacekeeping mission in orbit around a distant planet called Epsilon 3, and a long way from home base back on planet Earth. I can't just sit here and let six billion people be murdered because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oh, it's good to be the captain. People jump when you yell. Zach? Yes, sir. Take a walk. Yes, sir. You get to do all those heroic things that captains do. Now get the hell out of our galaxy! I don't think any other science fiction series has done a full saga where you have a, an actual beginning, and there's a middle of it, and there's an ending to it, like a big science fiction novel. The premise is a bunch of different races of people having to live together in this spaceship. It's a place where people come and go. It's, uh, it's intrigue, it's espionage. I think the beauty uh, and the interesting aspect of Babylon is that all characters change. No one here is exactly what he appears. It's not just action and war. There's a great deal of politics, Cold War, if you will, like uh, we played with the Russians in the 50s and the 60s. 15%. Jerry Doyle plays Michael Garibaldi on Babylon 5. He's in charge of security on board. Yes, which if you look at the show every week, you would think I'm doing a pretty bad job. <laughs> Because, I mean, someone's either getting killed or blown up or something's getting smuggled on board. You have it? Yeah, I got it. There's drugs, there's guns, sex, there's all that good stuff. Good luck, Captain. I think you're about to go where everyone has gone before. The master of this complex universe is the creator of Babylon 5, Joe Straczynski. Everything you see here and everything you see on the show is part of Joe's original concept. He has written almost every episode of the show, and almost nothing happens around here without his stamp of approval. Joe's roots are in the classics of science fiction literature. He grew up on the stuff, especially the big stuff, the sagas like the Lensman stories, the Foundation trilogy, and Lord of the Rings. <laughs> The idea of a saga... Impact in 10 seconds. ...of a science fiction story that continues from episode to episode had 
never been tried on American television before Babylon 5. And I said, why has no one ever done a saga for American television? The British have done it with Blake 7, with The Prisoner, with Tripods, other television projects. No one here has ever done it. The desire to do a saga like Babylon 5 has been a dream Joe's had since he was a kid. A dream that became a vision one day in 1986. The whole thing struck. I saw the entire multi-year storyline in one flash and spent the next year writing it all down, what I saw in that one moment of perfect clarity. From the start, Babylon 5 was designed to run five television seasons and tell a complex tale of future worlds clashing. But could an epic science fiction saga survive in a television universe of sitcoms, police dramas, and news magazines? For Joe and his friend John Copeland, who became the producer of Babylon 5, it was a long, hard sell. Up until Babylon 5, science fiction has been played down by the television community because it was expensive and time-consuming to do. The pitch I used to the executives who wouldn't know any better and didn't know from science fiction, didn't want to know from science fiction, is say, we're doing Casablanca in space. There was never a one-to-one -one correlation. Bruce is not the Humphrey Bogart, nor was he ever intended to be. It's just a way of getting across the idea to those who don't get it. But finally, someone did get it. Warner Brothers. Action. And in April 1993, shooting began for the first syndicated season of Babylon 5. This is my lovely co-star, Bruce Boxleitner. He's actually a really nice guy. <laughs> we can't dress ourselves in space. All told, it took six years from the day that Joe came in and presented us with his idea to getting it on the screen. For me, Babylon 5 is a real place. I sort of open a window to Babylon 5, I peek inside, I write down what happens, and run real fast. Up next, alien life forms and other cast members when we return to The Guide to Babylon 5 on TNT. The premise behind Babylon 5 is rooted in the dangerous bazaars and colorful capitals of ancient Babylon, a place intended for civilized negotiations, more often used by representatives of all the races and species to scheme and plot. The main difference between us and the original Babylon is that we have an even more diverse cast of characters. Really, really diverse. There are at least two dozen species of aliens on Babylon 5. And rather than having a token alien who just happens to be on our crew and a token alien here who do all these token aliens, you've got entire populations. Everything from the hose-nosed Gaim and the ill-mannered Drazi to the carrion-eating Pakmara and the mysterious Borlons, represented on board Babylon 5 by Ambassador Kosh. Ambassador Kosh has really turned out to be, I think, the fans' favorite character. You do not speak for the rest. These alien species are more than window dressing. They are often the main characters on the show. Your time is coming on! It's our turn now! The ongoing struggle between the reptilian Narns and the wildly quaffed Centauri Pig. is a central theme of the entire series. Another feature of this very political landscape You've changed. is the coalition between the mysterious Mimbari and the Earthlings. Playing these bizarre creatures is no job for ordinary actors. And the humans who do it are not your typical specimen. Take Mira Furlan. This is Ambassador Dylan of the Minbari. Mira is a major film star in Europe, but her fans might have trouble recognizing her as Dylan, especially in the early episodes, when she's sporting the bone crest common to all Minbari. Dylan is the ruler of the universe. Dylan knows so much more than any human does. Stand by to attack. Then there are the militaristic no Narns. Those darn Narns. The head Narn on board Babylon 5 is Ambassador Jakar, played by Andreas Katsoulis, a Shakespearean actor who's worked all over the world, and now all over the universe. Andreas gives Jakar all the emotional range and power of a great Shakespearean figure. We will be free. Even under all that Narn makeup. I was scared of Andreas for the first season. <laughs> I didn't know him too well. And he's an actor who becomes the character all day long. So if you have something to say to Andreas, get it in in the morning or get it in at the end of the day, because during the day, you're going to be dealing with Jakar. <laughs> the most boisterous and hedonistic alien species on board Babylon 5 are the Centauri. I'm Peter Jurczyk. I play Ambassador Lando Molare, the uh, 
the good Centauri ambassador to Babylon 5. With their peacock-like hair signifying their rank in society and Restoration-era clothes, the Centauri are definitely extravagant. What do you want, you moon-faced assassin of joy? Ambassador. Listen, as far as aliens go, there's nothing you'd rather be than a Centauri. The Mimbaris get so deadly serious, and the Narns are all that lizard stuff. You don't want to be them. We have, we have uh, six genitalia. We love to eat, drink, have parties. Come on, if you're lucky, you come back as a Centauri. Those of us who play human beings on Babylon 5 face certain special challenges, mainly competition from the scene-stealing, exotic-looking alien characters. And we have to do that without the benefit of outrageous makeup, costumes, and all the weird alien character traits. We like to think we compensate with our own natural charisma and star quality. Human. Yes, humans. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Jeff Conaway right here. Jerry. Oh, how are you? He plays Zach Allen on Babylon 5. So I'm a ranger, bit of a musketeer. Captain, what's up? I just Among the humans on board Babylon 5, Morning, gentlemen. First in the chain of command, This is your wake-up call. Is, of course, the captain. Then there's Claudia Christian. Don't jinx it. Who plays Commander Susan Ivanova, my second in command on Babylon 5. I prefer to be the captain, of course, but I'm usually running the station anyway. I mean, let's face it, Bruce is basically just sitting in his room thinking, you know, that's, or eating fruit or, you know. Claudia's kind of forever happy. This is our dolly grip shake. He's a fabulous guy. Funny. I do, Carl. Oh. Injects our cast and keeps our cast filled with energy. Well, this is where the extras stay. Hey, we can fight us. Hey, look, babe, here's a Valiant that you wanted. He takes Valiant. It's a rough job. It's a horrible job. Look, wait, wake up, wake up. You're, supposed to, you're being paid with Get out of here. Come on, come on. You're supposed to wake up. Look lively. The humorous story was Jerry Doyle. When Jerry Doyle came in to audition for Garibaldi, uh, the casting director asked him, what is your name and what job are you here for? Jerry says, uh, my name's Jerry Doyle, and I'm here for the part that I'm going to get. I leaned to my partner and said, that's Garibaldi. Oh, look at the time. We loved it. It's, it's beauties in the eyes of the beholder. Right. And thank God everyone's blind. The human characters of Babylon 5 are sometimes outnumbered, but never outdone. Going somewhere. Up next, special effects secrets and that spectacular makeup. When we return to The Guide to Babylon 5 on TNT. Every TV show has a makeup department. Here at Babylon 5, we have two. One handles the human characters, while a whole separate department, special effects makeup, takes care of the aliens. Because the Mimbari, the Centauri, and the Narns are such an important part of the show, their makeup not only has to be absolutely state-of-the-art, but the process of putting it on has to be streamlined fast enough for a television production schedule. It's a strange feeling when your entire head is covered with latex. Let's see. We had to design these makeups. For a television schedule, we have to do things fast. Two hours is roughly what we get to do the makeups. For a feature film, we'd ask for like four hours, so we did it in two pieces. I think all Narns have those lovely red eyes. And it's, it's very strange. You'd think looking at it that, that the person looking out from them would see red because they are very intensely red, but you don't. I almost turned down the role because they had asked me to do the part. I said yes, and then suddenly there was a call from the production office setting up an appointment for me to go have contact lenses fitted, and I said, what? And the director got on the phone and said, Andreas, you're gonna lose this part if you don't do this. For the creature to really look alien, we need to have the eyes. So I did, and to my surprise, I'm someone who can wear them all day Special effects makeup. This is where the aliens spend an extraordinary amount of time. Now, Mira spent how long in makeup this morning? Two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. How long to take it off? Um, about 40 minutes. So not only when you're done and you really want to go home and you're sitting and you just want to get in your car and drive home, she can't because she has to be deboned. Yeah. <gasps> Filet. Filet. Lot of fish. Mwah. My hair. Uh, sometimes in the morning, if it's humid out, it does look like this, but. It's my regular hair, and then they put on this kind of like piece you know, across that way. It takes about 30 minutes if I'm not talking to the 
the hair and makeup people, and if I'm talking about my life and crying obsessively in the chair, it takes about 45 minutes. Why would you be upset? Because. I really did shave my head for the pilot, which made it easy, but I couldn't bear being bald. An optic nerve came up with this bald piece that maybe I'm giving something away, but it, it isn't here. It doesn't go from here back. It goes across my nose and through my eyes. So people can actually come and visit the set and stand in front of me and look and say, I don't see where it's attached. It's that good. Well, this is a very nice number run up by the wardrobe department. And this is a silk, silk duster that I get to wave about. It doesn't look so futuristic. No, it doesn't, actually. It just looks like somebody who is just quite strange. So here we are. Fully complete, as an arm, red eyes, rubber, costume, dagger. Oh. Yeah. Ta -da. If you spend time watching them get into their makeup, you can actually see, particularly with Andreas, you see the transformation as the makeup becomes more and more complete of him becoming Jakar. <laughs> going through that ritual now. It's almost sort of like an inner response to the outer appearance. So I'm actually a robot. The series creator Joe Straczynski and the production team started working on the budget for Babylon 5. They had about $850,000 per episode to work with, a lot less than the typical budget for science fiction shows. But the producers had a secret high-tech weapon at their command. All the special effects for Babylon 5 are done on desktop computers. Babylon 5 was a first for bringing this type of technology in. All of our space scenes are done with CGI, computer-generated image. If you can use your imagination, see the ships land somewhere out there, which is called space. But you can't see this, and neither can I, because they put it in afterwards with a blue screen. So you just stand there, and you're just looking at nothing and we will add the rest of the pieces in, in post. Right now, we don't have any of the backgrounds for any of our blue screen composites. Keep firing! Susan! We don't have any CGI or 3D elements in. Then we give it to the animators. Yes. This is the coolest gig I've ever had. I animate pretty much everything that's not live action for Babylon 5. Ships, characters sometimes, that's cool. Planets, the space stuff. In this case, uh, for 406 Into the Fire, we actually had shots from the Hubble telescope. Uh, this nebula is actually a nebula that exists in real space. We kind of uh, brought out the colors we wanted a little bit. What I do is I say, well, who's got this shot? Who has my background? This is the foreground element that uh, was shot on stage. And the CG guys give me their 3D animation, which is the ship. And we're kind of approaching the ship. And what I have to do is composite the foreground and the background together. Then they transfer it back to tape. And then I drop it into the show. White Stars 4 and 9 are on it. Susan! Up next, the lighter side of deep space, when we return to the Guide to Babylon 5 on TNT. One thing we bring to Babylon 5 is a real dedication to our mission to create an epic science fiction saga and examine the great issues that we think will be just as relevant in the 23rd century as they are today. But with all that serious work being done, we still find time to laugh. Behind the scenes, Babylon 5 is not a tight ship. We ran a very loose operation here. This is Bruce. He works here. Hi, kids. Hey, come here. I'm actually not supposed to have this watch on, so you caught me in a blooper. It's all about the camera angle. And there's a certain thing. this. <laughs> AD, he's always talking. He's got one word in his entire vocabulary. That's all I'm he sorry. knows how to say. Now we're just uh, rehearsing over here. Are you rehearsing? Yeah, for your scene. For my scene, I'm here. All right, let's go quietly. Wait, hit me now. Be the good thing. 
See, then you go, ow, with the wrong hand. Now, Spend any time on the set of Babylon 5, <laughs> and you quickly notice something. Bam! Bam! This set is different. <laughs> People actually have fun making this show. Chensia, Chensia, slap me, please. Am I bloody enough? I think you're fine. Do Ooh, this. this tastes and let, horrible. And let's, let's get ready to rumble. There's no real important people here. Everybody's important here. Just go there. The motivation <laughs> is you go over there. <laughs> well, the I can do that. I can do it. All right. See, we like each other, so away from work, we spend time together. This is a whale watching trip we took. Our softball games. This is our ski trip that we took. But we have fun doing it. We have fun doing it. This is just, you know, we just got the right people. We've held on to between 85 and 90% of our crew. That's why we've all been together for so long. We really enjoy each other. This is a family. I know I didn't look at it. I know I don't do it often, but I was trying to act here. It's, uh, I was trying to take a moment. But anyway, it's over. Uh. <laughs> We all felt very strongly as we mounted that one five. We were going to hold ourselves to 12 hour days. And we do. We have a crew call at seven o'clock in the morning and we're done at seven. Now obviously if you've got aliens and makeup or something like that, they may have like a 430 call so that they're ready to work when the when the crew comes in. Now you are the first person we've seen in a suit. You know how all the creative people think about suits. I guess I'm one of them, but I hope not. Action! Joe and I kind of see our job as to kind of nudge people in the direction that we feel the series should go. How we get there is not important, just as long as we get there. Anyone who enjoys science fiction can tell you it's more than just a fascination with the future that draws people to the subject. It's also a sense of concern for the well-being of civilization and for the priorities we have in the here and now. So while Babylon 5 is entertainment, and we do it for fun, it's all part of a bigger picture. I'm a big believer in a space program. Every scientist will agree on one thing, that eventually our sun will grow cold and go out. When that happens, it won't just take us. It'll take Marilyn Monroe. And Lao Tzu, oh, Einstein. And Einstein, and and everything we've accomplished was for nothing, unless we leave the cradle and go to the stars. Now we have to make people lift their eyes back to the horizon and create the world we will live in. Many of the people who make Babylon 5 hope the show will have impact on the real world. There's no telling whether the universe of Babylon 5 is anything like what the real future holds. And what people behind Babylon 5 hope to do is inspire us to explore space, to look into the future, and to discover what the real destiny of mankind will be among the stars. I look forward to the day when your people join us beyond the rim. We will wait for you. The future's great, and uh, for people who are thinking about buying electric cars, they, they didn't work. So I'm trying to save people some bucks. And gasoline prices are way down now. Say goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Take care, Michael. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Let's go. Were you filming?